Black, the 12th edition of the Real Men Don't Play Show. Started off with the Supreme Court deciding that it would no longer be necessary to protect African Americans or other so-called minorities with the affirmative action. And then all hell broke loose right here in Los Angeles. Master Donald Sterling, the ruler of the basketball plantation known as the Los Angeles Clippers, got caught. Just when we thought that was bad, it got worse when we found out that one of the alleged preeminent organizations that represented the so-called colored people had decided they were going to once again honor Mr. Sterling with a lifetime achievement. When I heard that he was going to receive another award, I forgot he got the first one. And I remember years ago, people would walk up on the stage and receive that award and break out into tears. And it was always an emotional and uplifting moment as they talked about this person's accomplishments and achievements. And I'd like to go back and visit that tape and see how they uh, prepped that and presented that tape of Donald Sterling's achievement as it relates to the African-American community. Be that as it may, I have uh, a guest on the line right now who is the antithesis of what the NAACP has put themselves in the position of representing. And uh, his name is Wendell Stimley. He's the president and founder of Black IPO, which is a construction management company that operates in about five cities. Wendell? Let's talk about it. How you doing? Well, that's a good question, man. How are you doing? Uh, I'm fine, fine. Now, where are you at right now? Uh, Atlanta. Atlanta, Georgia. Um, just to kind of give my audience um, an understanding of what it is that you do and why I wanted you to, in a sense, uh, sit in on this conversation about ownership, responsibility, and accountability. Okay, well, uh, we pretty much find projects, finance them, and go into the managing of uh, constructing them uh, from the design to the finished product. Uh, that being said, I know what you want to get to is how have we got ourselves in a situation in 2014 as African Americans where we are taking sponsorship from folks into our organizations that may or may not have a uh, show us in a very good light or think very much about us. Well, with that being said, that's also the question of ownership. Um, I had announced earlier in the week that I was going to have a guest on my show who was prepared to make a very <clears throat> significant contribution towards the purchase of the Los Angeles Clippers. And in fact, I was speaking of you. What are your thoughts on ownership as it relates to uh, sports franchises? Well, I think it's time for if, uh, as African Americans, if we're going to venture down the road of engaging uh, that type of uh, ownership, we need to make sure that it has a voice with a significant stake uh, versus just a minor stake in the uh, ownership of any type of, uh, especially a sports team, because you affect so many areas of the economy from vendors, suppliers, uh, concessions, etc. So the model should be, and I was glad to see this week that a number of uh, individuals came out and said that they were interested in uh, taking a stake in a team or buying part of a team, but it definitely has to be in the majority 
or at least a significant level of ownership that will give you a voice and give you a seat at the table to have token ownership uh, that gives you no voice or a seat at the table, then a lot of the uh, situations continue because the myth is that we get upset and organizations get all riled up when people talk about you and you find out about it, but the truth of the matter is if you don't have a seat at the table, they might be talking about you and you just don't get an opportunity to to hear or know about that. So we have to be careful in getting too excited about uh, solutions that don't have an economic impact to uh, change the playing field because the whole process either continues or repeats itself. Next time, do we have a videotape or do we have an audio tape? Uh, And the only way to really diversify something to ensure that everybody has a equal voice. Now, what would be the ideal scenario based upon some of the conversations that you and I have had with some other people this week about positioning ourselves to acquire a franchise like the Los Angeles Clippers? Well, I mean, the first thing, contrary to what anybody wants to say or believe, it becomes a matter of money. You you know, it's going to have to have a significant amount of capital, and it's probably going to be a conglomerate-type situation to be able to put together the amount of capital to as I say, become a majority shareholder or actually acquisition. So egos are going to have to set aside, and it's going to take planning. It's going to take uh, capital infusion. But, I mean, it's it can be done. It's not, you know, uh, African Americans right now are considered a billion-dollar contributor to the economy. The problem is most of our billion dollars in that economy is going to consumer products. You mean trillion? Very little of it is going to generating uh, inner-city wealth. So we have to also address that uh, situation to try to figure out what would make it attractive to uh, the average citizen in the urban America to start thinking about transferring some of our consumer money into wealth building money. Now, you completed a, a project here in Los Angeles uh, over at the hospital. Uh, give us an example of the benefit of being in a, a, a lead position as you was on that particular project. Well, when you start talking about projects at the magnitude of Martin Luther King Hospital, which was done with uh, Hansel Phelps, you're talking about projects at four and five hundred million dollars. And when you have a project of that capacity, if you have a seat at the table, then you can start talking about things like vendors and suppliers and get down to some of the uh, small businesses that usually don't get an opportunity to get any visibility because there's no one sitting at the table that cares about them. Uh, We have all these community reinvestment acts, all these bank mergers that were supposed to bring all this capital to inner city uh, urban America, but yet we can't find ownership by those communities in any of the major development projects going on in their own community. So when we have a chance to direct that type of money in the direction of jobs and vendors and suppliers, we have an obligation to try to make that happen. So what role did you play in that project? Well, we were the uh, projects that design, build, are done from vertically, and you also have the infrastructure. And we had the infrastructure site responsibility, and the uh, major, the lead CM, Hansel Phelps, was a vertical constructor. So you have to get all of the footings in, piles in, all of the concrete site work, everything has to get done to support the foundation, then you bring the building up vertically. So how much money did you have to manage on that project? 
yourself? A uh, project like that, we do about ten million dollars under management. Okay, Wendell, I want you to hold on because um, I have a in studio guest that understands the language that you're speaking, and I'm going to start <clears throat> making sure that we are able to articulate these sometimes technical phrases to the point where people outside of the industry will completely understand what we're trying to accomplish with this conversation. So give me a minute and we'll be right black. The music you're listening to is from an album by a gentleman out of Birmingham, Alabama, by the name of D. Bradley, and that cut is called Too Much Man to Cry. And I tell you, boy, woo, it's been enough to cry about here lately to just say, oh, my Lord, Lord, Lord. I'm blessed with an in-studio guest who was riding with us last week, and he's going to be a frequent contributor to the Real Men Don't Play show, first and foremost because he epitomizes what men are and what men do. Uh, he's back tonight because this subject matter intersects with some of the things that he does for a profession. His name is Mark Williams. Um, the company that he proudly represents was started by his mother, the late Miss Juanita Tate, and that's the Concerned Citizens of South Central Los Angeles. Welcome back, Mark. Yeah, thank you. It's an honor and a pleasure. As you absorb this conversation uh, right now, what are your first impressions and thoughts? Um, in terms of what, Bobby? The what ownership you? aspect oh, oh. and uh, some of the things that have happened that really put um, the spotlight on our absence at the table when it comes to projects like the one Wendell just described, the project that you just completed successfully that is the opposite of what usually happens, as well as this mess with the Clippers. We, we have no future without ownership and productive investment. Uh, nobody's going to secure a future for us. Nobody's going to secure a place uh, in this city or anywhere else. Uh, we have to take our capital. Uh, we have to pool it when that's appropriate. And we have to invest in ourselves. Uh, and until we do that, we're always going to be subject uh, you know, to other folks who have taken the responsibility to invest and plan a future for themselves, we're always going to be subject to their interests and their reality. So oh. I, I, I don't see any alternative to that. Now, real quickly, what is the short-term, long-term impact of the uh, development that you just completed at the corner of Central Avenue and Slauson here in Los Angeles? Well, it's an 80,000-square-foot shopping center that was many years in the development process. Uh, but from the time that the development uh, left the drawing board, it actually stimulated the economy. It stimulated other development in the area. So uh, it had a tremendous impact on the local economy in terms of jobs, economic development, uh, even before it completed. And, and in many ways, thank God, it's obsolete by the time we cut the ribbon mm. uh, because the demand for goods and services in the area, quality goods and services, uh, outstrip the supply even now. Wow. So the, the project is well received. It's a long time coming. It includes, uh, it's, it's a typical sort of project uh, in most other areas uh, in the region. So it's a supermarket anchored project with Northgate Gonzalez uh, as the main supermarket. But you have other, um, uh, other retailers, shops and restaurants that are commonplace in other places. 
uh, Waba Grill, um, Panda Express, Panda Express, Chase Bank, Starbucks, yeah. Chase Bank, so mm-hmm. on and so forth. So it, it doesn't look anything. Uh, it's not very very different from development that goes on in other places. But what it makes it unique is where it is, not and what it is. The face of the project, people of color. That th- this is correct. You know, we took a lead role in uh, conceptualizing, developing, and implementing the project. Um, uh, we took a development role, and uh, now we take an ownership role and a management role as well. Wonderful. We have a gentleman on the line who was a guest a couple of weeks ago. He's an L.A. native, in my estimation, all-time one of the elite center fielders to ever play the game of baseball at the professional level. Currently, he's back with the team that he won a world championship with in 1990. Now his position is an assistant to the general manager of the Cincinnati Reds. I want to welcome to the show Eric Davis. Eric, how you doing this evening? I'm doing good, Bobby. How you doing, man? All right. It's ironic that we're having this topic tonight because at one point you owned a construction company, didn't you? Well, I had some... uh, I I did have a couple dollars in there. I did do some developing, yes. Okay, okay. And uh, being a native of this area, uh, next time you in, in in the vicinity, uh, please go down and, and, and check out the uh, the new what, what what what's the name of the joint? Oh, it's called Juanita Tate Marketplace at the at, corner of it's the, at the corner of Central and Slauson Avenue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay, right on. I yeah. would definitely partake in that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, as an assistant to a general manager, we're going to you know pivot back into the central subject matter for this evening, and that is the impact of ownership, the responsibility of ownership, and the accountability that you have to a community. And in that instance, we've seen some things happen that have been eye-opening since uh, the revelations around the uh, Donald Sterling situation. First and foremost, Eric, what are, what are your impressions of what has transpired since those tapes came out? Subsequent to that, he has been banned and there's all kind of stuff going on well um when it was first brought to light i was i was very disappointed uh shocked no but i was disappointed um i personally had some um uh, some run-ins with donald i mean i've i've known donald for years Uh, i've been to his house uh but uh am i surprised uh no uh, I'm one of the few athletes who've had uh, racial comments directly at them when Morris Scott called me a million dollar nigga. You know, so, <laughs> so it's nothing that goes on that would put me by surprise. Um, but to the magnitude and the and the consistency uh, of the dialogue, which was more disappointing than anything. Uh, because he's not the, probably the first person that ever feels that way. Uh, there's a lot of us that have said things behind closed doors. Mm-hmm. Uh, so who am I to say that we're not? Uh, well, we, we would definitely be kidding ourselves, but to have it go on and on, and, and there's a possibility of, of hours of tapes, is disturbing. Mm. You know, uh, since you've transitioned from a player to the administrative side of the sport, what, in your estimation, will it take for uh, – and, and the gentleman who's also on, on hold right now, his name is Wendell Stimley. He's calling out of Atlanta. He runs a company called Black IPO. And we've had several discussions. Wendell told me something that was, was really thought-provoking, and that is we really only have in all of the sports one African-American who is the owner, and that's Michael Jordan. What are your thoughts about uh, how do we move from where we are to – acquiring uh, majority stakes in professional sports franchises, Eric? Well, the first thing is that's a very, very small type fraternity. Uh, and just like any other fraternities or any other franchisees that you have, uh, not, not in just America, but, but in the world, you have to figure out a way to infiltrate that. Um, it was just the way that Jackie Robinson infiltrated baseball. He was the right man for the right spot. Um at some point, uh, having Michael Jordan, is he the right man for the right spot? I think so. Uh, but but he also had the capacity to be able to pay for the things that he wanted by himself. Uh, the finances is, is, is the most important thing, and how you acquire 
your finances is the most important thing. Okay, anytime somebody has to let you into their circle, they have to be full, be confident that that uh, you, you can handle the situation uh, from now on. Uh, and are we capable of doing that? Absolutely. Uh, are we in a point where we have a gang of resources as an individual to do that? Uh, probably not. But uh, collectively, we have to figure out a way to be allowed. <laughs> but far as if I can say that, is is uh, but we have to put ourselves in situations where uh, th- those decisions can be made, and when they're made, it's by reputable people. That's not going to give us a bad name. Now, I'd like for you to share with our listening audience uh, and my in studio guests and Wendell Stimley in Atlanta something that we talked about a few weeks ago uh, off the grid, so to speak. When you told me before Buck O'Neill died, he shared with you the fact that uh, there was a situation with um, the Negro Leagues mm-hmm. and the possibility of having several other teams become a part of Major League Baseball. Kind of revisit that uh, conversation. Well, yeah, it was a conversation that I did have with Buck. I was doing um, – actually, me and him was together on a, on, a, on a sports show actually some years ago. And uh, and I'm a historian. I mean, I love sports. And we were just talking about uh, the time that when Jackie Robinson uh, actually made uh, it, it his debut, how wonderful it was for this country uh, and for black people. It actually hurt us more uh, and from, from a financial and economic status than it did. Uh, to having him join, and the reason that was is because in the Negro League we owned everything. We owned the restaurants, we owned the uh, uh, the hotels, we owned the transportation, we owned everything that Major League Baseball owns now. Um, and the, and the competition was so lopsided to a point that when they used to play those guys, it would be eighteen to one and fifteen to two, and they would just <laughs> dominate at the Major League Baseball. Wow. So he actually said that there was a, a was a point that it was getting to where uh, the MLB was going to have to make a decision whether they would uh, what was going to have to allow some of those teams to join forces, uh, not knowing that Brands Ricky had this idea in mind uh, that was to infiltrate that with one player because any time that the Negro Leagues went to Wrigley Field and some of these major league towns. They sold out, and 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 people would come from miles and miles to see all of the great black ball players and stuff. So he said it, it, it was a great possibility that they were going to have to merge. And if that would have been the case, it, then there would have been our black owners uh, in Major League Baseball at that particular time. Uh, he didn't go into particular cities and things of that nature, but I found it interesting because of the fact that 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 we owned uh, everything about what we are today, uh, when you had the Negro League, it was it was just as popular. Uh, but we didn't have the sponsorship and things of that nature. But it, it was just as popular, and it set us back because of the towns that we were in, uh, and the black communities thrived on the Negro League. Uh, the, the way some of these cities strive on Major League Baseball or football or basketball. And when I was taken away, uh, it decimated the economy so bad that it actually hurt the people who couldn't play ball more than it helped the blacks who could play. Wow. Hey, uh, <clears throat> just hold hold tight for a second, Eric. I want uh, Wendell to chime in on this because he has a relationship with a man that you may know of because he – put in a, a valid offer for the Minnesota Twins several years ago by the name of Donald Watkins. You remember that, that situation, Eric? Uh-huh. Okay, so Wendell, can we get Wendell back on the line? Wendell. Uh, and this is what uh, we have to address. It doesn't, you can have a fraternity, you can have a good old boys club, but and as long as everybody plays fair, and as long as the playing field is level, and as long as there is economic opportunity for all, people normally are not going to get too bent out of shape. But when folks start to feel as though you are using the fraternity as an exclusionary device, 
that affects uh, jobs and economic opportunity and vendors and suppliers, then it becomes something ugly. And that's kind of what people feel they got a glimpse of uh, this week, uh, past week. And uh, a gentleman called me, and it was Donald, and he had been vetted and financially qualified. You're talking about Donald Watkins. Independently. Right? You're speaking of to Donald. Buy the Minnesota Twins and had great ideas about expanding the uh, footprint and the services and the uh, edifice around the stadium. And uh, obviously, I was flattered. Being a young person with a young firm, to even be considered to be, you know, at that table of uh, uh, as as providing those type of services, and to have uh, him spend that much time and that much money and that much due diligence, and just because they could, and just because uh, the commissioner may not have felt, well, that's you know, exactly the person that they want, then that's when it becomes a problem. When you can stop something because it's African-American based that has already been vetted and pre-qualified to do it. And this, you know, this went all the way to 60 minutes. Dan Rather even conducted this interview. So, I mean, that's when it gets to be what's really going on behind those closed doors that keeps us in a... Uh, CEO worker type mentality. Now, let me just kind of capsulize <clears throat> what you just said. You're saying you had a relationship with Donald Watkins as it related to him acquiring the team and you were going to do some of the construction work on that uh, stadium project. Is yeah, I talked to him. He had already been vetted to buy the team and obviously his ideas were to improve the facilities that went along with that. And for the kind of money he was putting up on the table, his own money, there was no reason for that deal not to get approved by the owners and by Commissioner Seeley. Okay. Hey, hold on, Wendell. I want to flip back to Eric for a minute. And Eric, you still on the line? Uh Uh-huh. What I want to ask you right now, uh, let's look at the Cincinnati Reds organization when you first came in the organization, and now, what has changed, good or bad, over the, uh, the period of 20-some years that you have been associated with that organization? Well, we had went from being um, uh, the first in Cincinnati Reds was the first professional baseball organization uh, in America. So uh, the, the history that they have is long-standing. Uh, prior to me getting drafted, it was a phenomenal organization. Uh, it was ran by great, upstanding people. Um, and then we had a situation where Mark Schott actually took over uh, the 51% of the ownership. And then it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a law. Um, uh, I don't really think that she was uh, a baseball person who knew anything about baseball. She was a woman uh, who was able to purchase a team. Uh, and a lot of her views weren't baseball orientated. Uh, she was a kind of person who would say, uh, "Why do we need scouts? All they do is watch baseball." <laughs> that should let you know what her intellect was about the sport. Um, and 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 the city of Cincinnati paid for that because our organization wasn't nearly as strong uh, in the development side, even though we won a title. Uh, a championship under March, um, it really it really put a, a, a black cloud on the organization about how it was being ran, uh, what people thought about our organization. Uh, there was a lot of people. We lost a lot of great scouts. We lost a lot of great front office personnel because of her ignorance uh, and, and not knowing uh, what to do with this franchise. And so when you look around and you see uh, how the dynamics have changed and now that the owner group that we have are baseball people and you can just see the revelation of, 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 of how the fans are, uh, how the players feel, um, 
uh, even what we do now, um, as far as our Hall of Fame in Cincinnati and and the new stadium and 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 how many players returned that that played an intimate part in the success and the history of this franchise. Marsh, I've never opened the doors for those things, mm. and so and so now you mm. see uh, a great deal of ex players involved in some capacity uh, with the existing players, whether it's through. Uh, could come into training camp or different events that we have. Uh, uh, it involves everybody that was part of that family, and for years we didn't have that. And so I've seen it come to full circle, good, bad, and then back to good to where it is now. And that's solely, solely based on 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 the Castellini family and what they stand for as as not just owners but as people in general. Uh, is because you can see how this organization is being ran, not just for whites, but blacks, Hispanics, and we have a, a different variety of a lot of different people that works up under that. And, and you can see uh, how important it is in diversity for our ownership to do what they do is because it allows people to come to work and do the things that they're doing and not feel like they're being watched or, or, or being scrutinized or being uh, discriminated against or something to that capacity. So it's a, it's a, it's a feel-good feeling for the fans and, and ownership in Cincinnati right now. Um, Mark, <clears throat> what are your thoughts on some of the things that we've talked about in the last 15 minutes or so? Well, you know, there, there are two things uh, that are important. One is just as a matter of principle around the Clippers uh, or the Donald Sterling situation. We have to be very, very careful and mindful of the idea of depriving somebody of their property based on their beliefs, right? So that's a separate issue. Uh, sometime uh, when, when the, the Fuhrer dies down a little bit and we can view it a little more soberly in terms of what comes next, we got to be very, very careful about supporting the proposition of denying a person their property based on their misguided beliefs. But then the second thing is uh, Eric's conversations with, uh, with Buck O'Neill uh, speak to me. Right now in the United States, uh, there's a tremendous opportunity, there's tremendous growth uh, in soccer. Uh, Donald Sterling bought the Clippers for $12.5 million, according to Los Angeles Times reports. And some 20 or 30 years later, if he's forced to sell it, if he decides to sell it, he's going to sell it for more than a billion dollars, and folks are lining up to do that. Uh, it would seem to me that it, whoever buys it next, uh, are they getting value for money? Right? And is it, would that be the best investment of resources in the sports industry uh, to spur economic development in communities like mine? Maybe, maybe not. Mm. Uh, uh, there, there's, there, there's some. We could have a discussion about that. But what I do know is that there is a possibility for sensible investments of three to five million dollars uh, to build facilities that can house uh, and produce a wonderful brand of soccer, and the sky's the limit <clears throat> over the next 10, 15, 20 years. So uh, when, when black folks are talking about investing in professional athletics, professional sports, the ground floor for the NBA was many, many decades ago, mm. right? But there are other ground floors. There are other possibilities for folks who have some resources to invest in some vision. Uh, instead of, uh, you know, it, it, it's it would be a wonderful thing to own a major sports franchise. There's no doubt about it. And for folks who can pool their money with other institutions and other inst uh, uh, individuals to make that happen, it would make me proud, you know, to have uh, black folks to have a piece of that larger pie. But I'm not sure that that's the best value mm. for the investment. There are other opportunities that I know about, and I would love to talk to anybody who would be interested in finding out more about it. Man, great point. Uh Wendell, let me get Wendell back into this fray here. Uh, Wendell, uh, based yes, on sir. what Mark just said, uh, is it a way to split the difference? Is it a way to kind of peel into this lane that he's speaking about and at the same time still be able to uh, get an equity position in a major franchise and make some money? Well, 
Yeah, if we listen to what Eric said, a very important point is you are never going to have the climate such that African-American group will be not necessarily blocked as much at the table like Donald Watkins was, who more than qualified to buy the Minnesota Twins. So let's understand. We've got to understand your black skin does make a difference. Mm. Okay. You can't do, even if you got the money, the intellect, and the wherewithal to do because of that black skin. So you got to first be able to process and understand that's just a problem for some people. <laughs> okay. So when you start talking about entering <laughs> fraternities and um, historically exclusive uh venues, you got to have some type of leverage. You're never going to probably have this type of leverage in acquiring ownership with a qualified group. See, what folks don't understand, there have been a lot of qualified groups that have been denied access to purchase. So we first got to understand that this hasn't been a lack of capital. This hasn't been a lack of education. I heard somebody say the other day, uh, well, does Floyd Mayweather have the background and the education to own, to be a, you know, a majority shareholder in a sports franchise? Well, I tell you one thing. <laughs> I think Floyd Mayweather has showed more business savvy than uh, Mars showed when she owned the Cincinnati Reds. So, I mean, we got to keep it in perspective that that black skin is going to have an impact on you being approved. So knowing that this situation does lend to at least people allowing you to be heard and get a seat at the table and look at your offer and take your offer uh, seriously. On another note, if Mr. Sterling has the right to hold on to the team until the court tells him he cannot hold on to the team no more or until the owners say this is at such a financial detriment, we can allow you to just continue to hold on. Because what will happen to that asset, it may be worth a billion dollars today, but if they keep putting them black signs up on CarMax and United <laughs> Airlines and everybody else, then we're not going to be a sponsor on this team while he owns it. And if he wants to hold it for another five years, it may be only worth $400 million. <laughs> so we got to keep in perspective that business and economics is dynamic. It's not static. It don't wait. It keeps moving. Mm -hmm. And it the rules change on a daily basis. So if you're devaluing an asset, it's like a roller coaster going downhill. Mm -hmm. You got to do something to stabilize mm -hmm. that because people aren't going to keep investing money into something that's not bringing back a return. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody sit tight. Uh, we're going to take a real short pause and the last segment of the show, I want to look at solutions, alternatives, and the way forward. So we'll be right back in about 60 seconds.
All right, we're back and still black. Uh, the last segment, uh, I want to throw one little thing out there about uh, accountability from an organizational standpoint. Uh, what's troubling to me has been the fact that it was revealed to all of us that for $45,000, an organization that's been around uh, nearly 100 years uh, was prepared to give Donald Sterling his second lifetime Achievement Award. My concern is that's not a game changer, forty five thousand dollars. But what it did in terms of the, the, the world view of that, when people heard that this man was going to be uh, the recipient of a lifetime achievement award, and, and everybody knew that paid any attention to the news that he had done some things over the course of the last twenty years with that that was so reprehensible that it seemed inconsistent with the uh, thought of the award. So I'm going to start with my in-studio in guest, uh, Mark, and get, get your feelings about that. Uh, the, the, we can start by understanding uh, that there is no particular organization that claims to represent black folks that can represent all black folks. There's such a diversity uh, in terms of where we live, what we earn, what we believe, uh, that I'm not exactly sure who got the benefit of the bargain. Uh, because what does it matter that that particular organization supported Donald Sterling? They don't have a, a, a tremendous presence and a tremendous credibility that, like it once did. Uh, so uh, there are always going to be opportunists. There are always going to be folks that get in the short line for whatever reason. The $45,000 that the organization received may not be a game changer from our perspective, but it may have been a game changer uh, from the perspective of the people who are in a leadership position uh, in that organization. And that's, uh, that's tragic because what they've done uh, is sold their credibility for $45,000. And at the end of the day, uh, no, that, that amount of money is not worth it. Uh, but they're not unique in that situation. There are thousands of nonprofits that go out of existence every year uh, after the 2008 uh, financial collapse and uh, uh, the real estate market collapse, nonprofits started to go out of business, foundations started to cut back, and uh, organizations that don't have a firm financial footing based in b business, the folks who existed as charities and uh, things like that, they're at the mercy of contributors. Uh, and I think that particular organization found itself in that position. Or it could be worse. It just could be uh, entrepreneurial opportunism masquerading as uh, representing the interests of a particular community or a particular constituency. Okay. So, uh, Eric Davis, what are your thoughts on what we saw and how it made you feel? Well, um, it was uh, I got, it was kind of unique because uh, – I looked at it uh, in two ways. I looked at it one way uh, from, from a financial uh, standpoint, from a nonprofit organization, um, to to thrive uh, off the donations and sponsorships. Um, what is the value, and how and how high do you hold the value and the credibility of what you're trying to accomplish as an organization? Uh, if my forty-five thousand uh, dollars is well spent, and 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 I feel good about where that money is going, and the, and the kids and the, that, that that I'm helping who are in dire need, uh, do I accept this money knowing uh, where it's coming from? Uh, we've been dealing with that for ages. Mm. Uh, you know, when you talk about drug money, how it did this. Uh, uh, Harlem in the 50s and 60s, you're talking about what the cartels did in Miami, had built up uh, all of South Beach, uh, and you talk about a lot of different things where 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 unsophisticated money uh, has, has helped transform lives in a positive way. Where do we draw that line? Uh, it, 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 to me, it's based on the individual organization in which you stand for. Uh, I see it both ways. I see it as a, as a situation where, yeah, I'm in dire need, and, and, and I would rather say I would take this 
seventy-five or forty-five thousand dollars and do more good than it would for me to close my doors and not do any good at all. So uh, I think it's based up to them. I, 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 I know that that, that NAACP has to feel shamed. Um, I know a lot of people that's around the country probably feel the shame for them. But yeah, you have to look at the criteria on, 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 on how it came about. I don't understand how anybody can get two lifetime achievement awards. I mean, you have to leave and come back <laughs> you know what I'm and do some more good. So, so if they was going to give him another award, it should have been a lifetime achievement award. You know what I'm saying? It should have been a neighborhood award or something of that nature. But the, the award that was mm. the, was getting ready to be given was a second term of a lifetime achievement award. Mm. And I think that's what got more people baffled <laughs> than anything. But was that the name of the award that they were given? If they would have gave him the Good Charlie Award and he paid forty five thousand for that, okay, yeah, we can rub it a certain way. But you talking about a lifetime achievement award when you've known for a long period of time uh, what was a part of this man's resume mm, mm. Uh, on how he was treating blacks as as well as a Latino? Yeah. Uh, as far as a lifetime, no, I can't. I can't. I can't fathom that <laughs> from any form. But to understand the side of of of, of how why am I receiving this money? Um, it's, it's totally up to the people. Now I've seen where people have said, well, we're not going to take any more or we're going to give the money back and things of that nature. So it is, it is really predicated on the people and what integrity that they have with that foundation and what kind of financial strength that they have that could probably get them out of the situation to help the people that they're trying to help. Oh man, I, I can fully uh, appreciate uh, your response to that, particularly the last segment. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Wendell that Stem- would bother me. I'm, you know. Okay, let me holler at Wendell on that. Wendell, what say you about this? Well, <laughs> first thing, y'all got to take ownership. That was the Los Angeles <laughs> chapter of the NAACP that thought that that had some type of logical basis. Wait a minute, hold on, hold on. Wait a minute, why you had to put the Los Angeles part of it? It's the, it's the NAACP. Because, no, that's what CNN said. The Los Angeles chapter of the NAACP uh, thought that that made some type of sense. So first we got to clarify, because when I think of the NAACP, I think... Uh, uh, the founding fathers, I think, because, you know, Major Evans in the driveway, I think about all the stuff the NAACP has done positively, and to have that tarnish in that way just was, it, it was hurtful. But the organizations have to survive. That in no way what goes on in Los Angeles should be, uh, duplicated anywhere else in the country, I would hope, that especially these double lifetime achievement awards. <laughs> but on another note, and I don't want to belabor the point, Eric and myself was at a gospel brunch 10 years ago, sponsored by the NBA Players Association here in Atlanta. And it was All-Star Weekend. And Eric, I don't know if you remember, but we had enough money in that room then and now to buy any team that's for sale. Mm. So we we have a direction of capital issue and a consumer issue. We don't have a lack of resource issue. But back to this NAACP thing. <laughs> When you get these local chapters and they start having these dinners and these suppers and these hot wings, I'm telling you, these, these dinner sponsorships can turn your motive and objective bad. It just goes bad because <laughs> <laughs> you put that platform out there and if you take your donations and, you, and then the next thing you know they want a title sponsor. And, you know, folks like this show up that got, you know, equality problem, and the next thing you know, you got an L chapter situation where somebody's getting a double lifetime achievement award for knowingly documented 
in court records of discriminating against housing against African Americans. That is totally outside of the mission mm. and outside of the founding fathers' vision of what the NAACP should be doing. And that should never, ever, ever happen again. And I'm, I hope and I'm sure that at higher levels, more reasonable minds are saying we have to have a criteria of donorship and sponsorship, especially when we're sponsoring uh, to have these galas with dinners and suppers. And these, these hot wings have got out of control. <laughs> So that's my 10th cent on it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to whiz back around the table. I'm going to give each one of y'all uh, 60 seconds for final thoughts. And I'll start with Mark in the studio. Well, first off, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to uh, have a conversation with these gentlemen. Both of them are heroes of mine. Uh, there's opportunity uh, in the midst of a parent crisis. Uh, and as I'm saying, there are growth industries, there are folks uh, uh, among the black community with tremendous resources, tremendous facility, tremendous experience, tremendous education. Uh, it'd be great if we could share some of that and make some collective decisions about where best to focus our, our collective efforts uh, and we can get return on our investments and our efforts. Okay, thank you. That's Mark Williams here in the studio. Eric Davis, final thoughts. Well, um, okay, I do remember the brunch in Atlanta. We had a great time, and it was the most powerful people that was down at that brunch. But uh, I, want, I, want to, I just want to close by saying that uh, um, I, I hope that there's a learning curve that was brought, um, especially to blacks, about, about how we're still being viewed in this country. Mm. Uh, and as, as, as from, from a resource standpoint, uh, sometimes we can become our own worst enemy uh, with, with greed and selfishness. And, and I just hope that we can eradicate that side uh, because we do have resources, we do have the intellect, but we do have everything it takes in order to not just own a professional fan charge, but to do anything that we want to do. And, and if we learn anything, if, if we can't pull together under this circumstances, then when, where, and how? Man. Eric, uh, eventually I want you to come in the studio, and I'm going to continue to reach out to you because you're a very insightful and resourceful brother. And um, I thank you once again for participating, participating in the show this evening. No um, problem. Hey, Wendell, final thoughts? Final thoughts. Uh, how do we get people to value us? and how do we truly appreciate and value ourselves. I don't care how small a business you start. you got to start that business with the idea of exponential growth. Because mm -hmm. business is about generating revenue and generating income and eventually generating some type of financial stability. So you got to start any business with the idea of exponential growth domestically and even internationally and stop letting other folks put limits on you that have your mind polluted with the fact, well, the reason they own the teams is because Nobody has stepped up to ever try to buy one. There have been many attempts with capital, with the intellect, with the structure, and we got to understand in corporate America, just like in sporting America, there is a need for us to understand that leveling that playing field is going to take some effort by all of us. And that effort should not only go from the guy that is owning the corporation or owning the franchise or owning the sports team, but to the person that's trying to become a vendor in that corporation or that franchise or that sports team. So I, I just hope that in urban America and in black America, we start to look at all of this of not limiting yourself based on what other people perceive about you 
and take the initiative to look at it, I'm going to win irregardless. Mm. Man, oh, what do you think about me? Okay, Wendell, thank you. And my final thoughts on this subject tonight is ownership, as we have seen it exhibited uh, over the last couple of weeks, is about just that. You have a right in this country to get rich. You got a right to go broke. And as African Americans, I think it's very, very important that we understand one thing. If you don't take a risk, you can't expect a reward. And this is evidence is why the show tonight is evidence that we need to look at ownership, entrepreneurship, self-reliance, self-determination. And finally, I want uh, the people out here around the country and the world to see this book, know that you can purchase it um, from iTunes and Amazon. I'll be in uh, Barnes and Nobles in the foreseeable future. I hope in the next couple of weeks. And in the meantime, you can you can you can get my book directly by contacting me at Bobby at RealMenDon'tPlay.com, or you can go to my website www.RealMenDon'tPlay.com. I hope this show in some way tonight has been helpful, inspiring, insightful, or uh, in some way worth your time that you took to watch it and that's the end of it for tonight and as i close as I always thank you for letting me be myself again we out of here